Uh, thank you. Can I, as it's already been introduced, don't need to introduce the motion again, but I can call on Kate Forrest, Minister, to speak to and move motion 14807 in your name. Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and it's great to be back in the Chamber to talk about the digital economy so soon after our most recent debate on digital participation. Now, November the 20th is not normally a date that springs to the forefront of people's minds when they reflect on the history of the digital economy. But on this day in 1985, so the history books tell me, Microsoft changed human interaction with machine learning because it was on this day that the first mass-produced personal computer graphic package, Windows 1.0, was released. And it's from that moment that digital technology truly began to enter the workplace and our lives and of course the lives of people worldwide was transformed uh, over the course well, of the last few indeed <laughs> i feel a history lesson coming on mr stevenson uh, unfortunately the minister has been badly advised as digital research produced the graphical environment G gem uh, some 10 years earlier Minister. Well, I'm grateful to Stuart Stevenson being in the chamber for a, an update to that history lesson. And I'm sure he can tell me further <laughs> later on. But back in 2018, which is where I prefer to exist, um, over 102,000 people are employed in digital occupations in Scotland. And the digital and the IT sector are currently worth £5.2 billion pounds in GVA to the economy and is forecast to be the fastest growing sector in Scotland by 2024. And yet despite this, it's a sector that still needs more work to keep up with the pace and the demands of change and requires an extra 12,800 new employees every year just to stand still. And the interesting thing is that this is a sector that's not just dominated by multinational companies but instead it's being shaped by smaller SMEs which, who require more support to meet those demands. For example, in Edinburgh, jobs in digital tech increased by over three times the UK average between 2014 to 2017, and there are now an estimated 10,000 people in the city working in the sector across 213 businesses, creating 1.4 billion pounds of turnover and those figures are of course replicated in Glasgow and to a degree in Dundee, Aberdeen and Inverness. The latest Tech Nation survey found that digital tech workers are more productive on average by 10,000 pounds per worker and that jobs requiring digital tech skills command higher salaries at 42,578 compared to 32,000 for those that do not. But what those figures illustrate is a growing and innovative sector, one that holds a distinct opportunity for Scotland's economy and our future ambitions. But the thing is that we, you do not have to be a tech business or a startup to be able to take advantage of the digital opportunities and the emerging technologies. Since taking over this ministerial role in June, I've tried to travel the length and breadth of Scotland to meet as many small businesses as possible who are taking up digital as a way of improving their business processes, their capabilities and their productivity. And many of those, indeed. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way and she's clearly enthusiastic, as I think we all should be, for the opportunities, the positive opportunities. But is there not also a danger that if we only frame this debate in terms of positive opportunities, we may actually miss a trick. There are downsides, there are risks from this agenda as well. Uh, and without wanting to pour any cold water, we'll only maximize the opportunities if we identify uh, and take action to mitigate any downsides uh, and risks in terms of worker protection and a whole host of other issues. I wonder if the, if the minister would reflect on that. Minister. Yes, and I thank Patrick Harvey for that comment, which he also made during the digital participation debate. And it's a, a point that I take very seriously. And re in response, I'd say there's three main concerns I have. The first is what we're doing with data and making sure that ethics are right at the heart of our strategies on data. The second is protecting our people, uh, a pr particularly perhaps young people that are coming through school at the moment and only 
know um, op uh, sort of engaging with others um, online. Um, and in conjunction with Young Scott, we are supporting the Five Rights campaign, which I'm sure he's come across, which is young people's right to remove information, to know what their rights are, to safety and support online, to have uh, informed and conscious use of online and to be digitally literate. And the third point is making sure that, as he says, when it comes to automation and workers' rights, that those are at the heart. So, Can I just say, Minister, don't worry about taking interventions. There is time in hand, right. so we've plenty of time. So I think in conclusion to Patrick Carvey's point, these are issues that um, are, are, I suppose, shaping our whole strategy when it comes to um, both uh, economic growth because of digital and also supporting um, workers uh, and people that are using digital. Moving back to, to the economy, Many of the businesses, whether it was Swanson's Fruit Company in Inverness, Woodblocks in Dingwall, or Peter Contracts in Lanarkshire, are not necessarily tech companies, and they in were initially far removed from the digital technology that they are now using. But thanks to government-backed programmes such as Digital Boost and the recently launched Digital Development Loan, they are now finding new ways to get digital and to enhance their digital presence and it's companies like this that are the lifeblood of local of the local Scottish economy that we have to encourage to become more digitally aware. Now I often hear on my travels not least as a Highland MSP that connectivity especially in rural areas is a barrier to small businesses getting online and whilst that may be true in many of the hard to reach areas in this vast country of ours it's still the case that even those that are connected are still not making the most of what we have in terms of the infrastructure. A recent Scotland's Rural College report about unlocking digital potential of rural areas in Scotland and across the UK stated, and I quote, even when such concerns about network connectivity are put aside, more than half, at 52%, of the rural businesses surveyed identified some other constraint which has reduced their ability to go digital. So there are clearly barriers other than connectivity that we need to address and that is why I hope that this debate in particular will be constructive in doing so. Some of those barriers are of course structural but others are personal uh, uh, and about aspiration. And it's that ambition that we want to see unlocked and digital represents a huge opportunity for Scotland. Digital also enables the most excluded from the job market, be they mothers of young children or disabled people or young people with fresh ideas. It affords them the same chances to participate as anybody else if we ensure that our support is right. The other advantage of the digital economy is that it enables businesses to become more productive, to streamline processes and to become more efficient. A recent CBI Scotland report said that Scotland's productivity Ha, falls short of overseas countries and differs across Scotland with an up to 50% variation between local authorities in Scotland. And the report stated that one of the contributing factors to productivity was a skilled and a diverse workforce. It quoted research, it quoted research that suggests firms with a high level of gender diversity outperform rivals by as much as 15% and firms with high levels of ethnic diversity outperform rivals by as much as 35%. But I shall take the member's intervention. Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much for the Minister giving way. On the subject of skills, does the Minister share my concern about the uh, significant decline in teachers teaching maths and computer science and the negative impact that might have on the future workforce in the digital economy? Minister. Well, I think that's why the Deputy First Minister's commitment to ensure that there are more uh, teachers in STEM subjects in particular is so welcome. Uh, and things like the, the career um, changing bursaries of £20,000 to those who want to move into teaching STEM subjects is so vital. But I believe that if we, need, if we want the, the skills and the next generation particularly, digital skills, not just so that everybody comes out the other end of school as software engineers, but become teachers, become doctors, become nurses, become carers, with the digital skills they need, then we will see transformation right across the public and the private sectors. There are great examples of Scottish tech companies that are striving to uh, address the need for partnership between business and government in order to spread good working practices and to change workplace culture. 
Many uh, companies have, in partnership with the Scottish Government, signed up to the 50-50 by 2020 initiative, aiming for a gender-balanced board in order to ensure that we have that higher level of productivity. There are businesses who um, identify the challenge of engaging with the public sector as one of the, the hurdles that they have to overcome. Now imagine if we could harness the power of digital so that that business doesn't have to provide the same information multiple times to the public sector and that the time taken to make a decision is reduced by from 28 days to one day. Imagine if there was a single place where a business or a citizen could access information on the progress of an application at, on a device and at a time of their choice. And that is what the Scottish Environment Protection Agency's anticipated time reduction will be following introduction of their common licensing platform. And all this because SEPA have automated repetitive clerical tasks and joined them up in, by allowing staff to focus on where they can truly add value. And that's what we want to see right across the public sector so that we support businesses and citizens and entrepreneurs as much as possible to achieve their ambitions. And of course, we need to do this in a way that ensures um, we are operating in a safe and secure way online. And that's why we are putting cyber resilience at the core of everything we do in the digital world. Our public sector action plan was published last November and is now well advanced with NDPBs, health boards, local authorities and universities and colleges all working hard to ensure a common baseline of cyber resilience. And earlier this year, the Deputy First Minister published our private and third sector action plans on cyber resilience, setting out how the Scottish Government will work in partnership with leading businesses and charities and the National Cyber Security Centre to help make Scotland a world leading nation in cyber resilience. Everybody will be well aware of the strengths of Scotland's financial sector. There's a depth of talent and expertise that we have in Scotland, particularly in Glasgow and Edinburgh. And that is one reason that companies are continuing to choose to invest in Scotland. Whether it's Barclays' recent announcement of its commitment to a new facility in Glasgow, or just this morning I was visiting Clydesdale Bank to see the ways that they are supporting their businesses and their customers with better online platforms. And advances in technology, especially in the field of data, mean that the world of financial services is changing. Scotland is particularly well placed with its strong financial sector and its world-renowned data and analytical expertise to exploit those opportunities. The value of data-driven innovation to the economy is forecast to be up to £20 billion over the next five years and there are aspirations for Scotland to become a global centre of excellence in this field with positive developments beginning to happen in oil, in healthcare, as well as fintech. And we cannot allow unwanted and unneeded barriers to jeopardise those aspirations. So as I close, much of what I've spoken about this afternoon is looking at the positives that we possess as a country and the opportunities that we have in adopting digital. Our refreshed digital strategy in 2017 has a vision for, of digital for everybody at its heart. And of course, work needs to be done to realise our ambitions, but we're starting from a solid base. And my encouragement to every member in this chamber today is to champion the message of digital to constituents and to, and to businesses, and to consider some of the challenges that Patrick Harvey ha has set out when it comes to um, the ethics that are required, the rights of, of our people, and the way in which we protect users uh, and businesses. But I do hope that as over the course of this debate, we can look at the way that the digital economy provides for the businesses and the citizens in every local area across Scotland. And, presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. And I call on Finlay Carson to speak to and move. Oh, before I do that, can I ask all members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please? Some haven't done it. Now call on Finlay Carson to speak to move Amendment 14807.1. And again, I can be generous if you take interventions. Mr Carson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open today's debate from the Scottish Conservatives as my party spokesman on the digital economy. It's only a few weeks since I closed for our party 
uh, on digital inclusion, which brought uh, many pertinent issues surrounding people's access to digital access as technology continues to develop at a rapid pace. We are indeed in the rapidly developing and enveloping fourth industrial revolution and Scotland, as it has been in the previous three revolutions, should be leading it. No cabinet secretary, minister, shadow minister or backbencher would be fulfilling their par parliamentary duties without the recognition of the pivotal role digital technology will play in all our futures. It's therefore fitting that the minister has brought forward another debate surrounding digital industries to the chamber. And there is much in this, the Scottish Government's motion and indeed the Labour's motion that these benches here will agree on. Ms Forbes should, and I have no doubt, will be a regular contributor to parliamentary debates in her role as Digital Economy Minister because there is not one aspect of our future that won't be shaped by decisions taken around the fourth industrial revolution. I welcome recent research which suggests that the take-up of digital devices has been happening faster in Scotland than in any other part of the UK. However, there is much more that can be done to ensure that we can go further to ensure Scotland does have a bright digital future, as my amendment refers to. As an MSP for a rural constituency, not a day goes past when I'm not contacted by an individual or organisation pushing for greater urgency when it comes to delivering better connectivity in their homes or premises. It's clear that far too many businesses are still not properly equipped when it comes to digital technology, which in turn negatively affects productivity and innovation. I genuinely hope that R100 can deliver for rural Scotland despite the stark warnings from Audit Scotland. Because when it comes to digital revolution, we can't afford to leave anybody behind. We often hear the term digital divide, and that so often simply refers to internet connectivity. The divide used to be between those who had broadband and those who had dial-up, and then those uh, who had broadband and those who had super fast. But there are still those who, still, who have connectivity and those who simply don't. With the pace of change ever increasing, the digital divide could potentially get wider, and the real divides would not only be economic opportunity, but even more so in social health and well-being dimensions, and we can't allow it to happen. I did have a constituent contact me after the last debate to make sure we didn't forget about uh, the potential for people uh, being excluded who suffered from digital autism. Now, we know that the digital economy business survey was carried out last year, just how important developing our industries for digital future is to them. It's concerning that only one in four businesses say their employees were fully equipped with the skills to meet their digital needs which is down from 37% in 2014. When you combine that stat from the facts that over three quarters of businesses said in the very same survey that digital technologies are essential or important for the current operation of their business. And it's more clear than ever that action needs to be taken to address the imbalance of when, uh, in our businesses when it comes to the new technologies. Now, we are seeing some positive changes. Certainly. Stuart McMillan. I thank Finlay Carson for taking the intervention and uh, on his point regarding uh, business but also on the amendment that the Conservatives have put forward regarding city deals. Is he therefore content that his government uh, in Westminster is actually underfunding the city deals by over £400 million? Finlay Carson. Well, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I'm involved with the Borderlands deal and I'm looking forward to an announcement in the spring where some of the digital technology improvements we need in uh, rural Dumfries and Galloway and the borders will be addressed. Now, the, we've seen uh, advancements, particularly in health and social care, and Scotland is certainly leading the UK when it comes to developing these new applications. And Scotland's universities also have a global reputation when it comes to the development of artificial intelligence. When we see the expansion of the expertise at the Edinburgh School, uh, or Edinburgh Centre for Robotics, and the university's Artificial Intelligence Applications Institute. That all uh, links very positively to the UK government's industrial strategy, which aims to put the UK at the forefront of the industries of the future, and at the heart of that is making the UK a global centre for innovation. As my amendment today states, this is where I believe the Scottish and UK governments can work together, along with stakeholders, in order to ensure that the UK are not left behind when it comes to the fourth revolution. 
The city and region deals which have been brought together by the two governments working together are a perfect opportunity for ensuring our industries have the investment to develop new technologies and open up new opportunities for communities, in particular communities in rural parts of Scotland where it's harder to bring new technologies into action. That's why I hope the Scottish Government takes seriously the recommendations from the SCDI. Most pressingly, they say that Scotland currently lacks the strategic leadership for the fourth industrial revolution. And they point out this Minister. lack. <laughs> Minister. He welcomes then the appointment of the first minister for the digital economy in the Scottish Government. Mr. Carson, be gallant. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I would prefer if you'd become a cabinet secretary. Because as your shadow, that might have put me uh, in uh, the, the, the shadow. <laughs> and I, I would have, have helped uh, to hold you to account. Um, as, as the SCDI points out, the lack of leadership is not exclusively down to the government. And it again highlights the importance of everyone working closely on future strategy. We must have a national focus on what Scotland can do to harness the opportunities that come in order to boost the economy. As the minister will remember, we had a very fruitful discussion surrounding data and soon after uh, that, she was appointed into a new role. And I'm heartened by the SCDI's belief that data is fundamental to the, uh, the latest industrial revolution. And they believe it's the current uh, strengths of, uh, of a lot of the technical companies in Scotland. If we can develop a strong data strategy, we can alleviate the risk that some associate with personal data. And then Scotland can truly unlock its potential. On that front, I would like to urge the SNP government into quicker action today when it comes to the Digital Growth Fund. The First Minister launched this fund worth 36 million in March 2017, but the first payments from the fund were not made available until June 2018. That's simply not good enough when we always need to be keeping up with uh, advances in technology. As for the Automatic for the People report, as it points out, there has always been winners and losers from any industrial revolution. And with accelerated growth in Scotland's cities, productivity has widened in comparison with rural areas. Any future digital strategy must address this geographical imbalance. Many of our vital sectors, whether it's food and drink, tourism, and indeed education and health services, are at risk of being left behind if their demands are not met with the latest digital strategies. We're at a critical point in terms of how our economy will develop for the next generation and who will be uh, able to access them is all important. The UK-wide industrial strategy white paper is a hugely important piece of work and outlines just what can be achieved through working together and addressing the current imbalances. It's been a pleasure to bring forward uh, the suggestions today and I highlight uh, more of the same in the amendment to which I now move my name. Thank you very much. And I now call James Kelly to speak to move Amendment 14807.2. Mr Kelly, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I, I move the amendment in my name. This is the third debate that we've had on digital issues uh, in a number of months. And I think it highlights, uh, the Minister was right to highlight, the important contribution that the digital economy uh, can make in Scotland and how we have to get this crucial area of the economy absolutely right because it's going to continue to grow and it's going to be a test as to whether we do properly have an economy that's uh, fit for the 21st century. Um, to, to me there, there are two kind of issues that I want to bring to the fore in terms of my contribution. Getting more people uh, access to the technology uh, and also ensuring that we address the skills issues that are required in order to ensure that we make the, the, the biggest potential possible of our digital economy. I think, listening to, reflecting on the past couple of debates, there is a, a slight element in terms of some of the discussions that uh, there's a bit of a bubble debate going on at Holyrood in terms of people, uh, you know, get concerned about uh, connectivity speeds, you know, what particular types of technology are available in different parts of the country. And there's a lack of recognition that sadly for too many people in the country and in too many areas, they don't have access to the internet at all, never mind uh, information technology devices. And the reason for that is that, you know, there are areas where, um, you know, there's a lot of child poverty, 230,000 uh, kids still living in child poverty, 487,000 people not being paid the living wage. 
Uh, and one of the wards in, within the Glasgow region I represent, rather going central and north, nearly ju just short of 28% of children are, are living in child poverty. And what that means, if, you, if you've been brought up in a house like that, is that um, it's difficult to make ends meet, it's difficult to pay the bills, it's difficult to put you know, proper, uh, proper nourished meals on the table. And therefore, there's not the money available that, that people have got in other areas uh, to enable access to, to information technology. And that is not only detrimental to those individuals, it's also detrimental to, to the economy. Because if people don't have access to information technology, the, then a lot of people, the economic um, access that, that, that digital connectivity gives companies nowadays uh, is restricted if, uh, if there are areas where people don't have access to uh, the appropriate digital devices. So I think it's a bigger debate in terms of the budget about how you lift people out of poverty, how you uh, increase household income, but ultimately we need to address these issues uh, if we're going to ensure that uh, there's greater coverage in the, in the country for digital connectivity, and that is a direct uh, input into business. It's not just about the individuals themselves. I think the other issue that needs to be looked at is just, uh, you know, making the most uh, of this area. Uh, I mean, only 3% of companies in Scotland are, you know, in the top rating in terms of their, their, their digital capability. So that means that we've got a lot further, we've got a lot further to go. Um, and I think the, the other thing about that is that it's getting the right people into these companies. I think when I speak to businesses, one of the shortcomings they see is that, and I, I, to, to acknowledge, I know the, the government have made some progress in this area, but they feel that those graduating from colleges and universities uh, don't quite, aren't quite skilled up enough in the technologies that, the, 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 of, of the jobs that they're putting in place. I think the other thing is, it's a very fast moving area. Um, and we need to ensure that we've got people coming out, not just with the appropriate skills, but the, the appropriate capability to be able to pick up and develop the technologies quickly. I think one, sure. Minister. I, I take and I agree with a lot of the members' points. In terms of the current workforce, has he got any thoughts on supporting the current workforce with reskilling and upskilling so that they have the digital skills no matter what job they have? James Kelly. I think that's, I think that's an important point, you know, uh, that Kate Forbes makes, because one of the issues is, is around automation. And as we automate more, um, you know, there are tremendous advantages in that for business and also for individuals. But uh, unfortunately, there, there are people who don't necessarily at this minute in time have those, those IT skills. So I think there's a job to be done in terms of individual businesses as they change their focus to try and make sure that they take uh, their employee base with them and give the employees the, the opportunities in terms of upskilling. And I, thought, I also think there's a link into the government strategy and into the higher and further education sector to ensure that people have proper training opportunities so that it's absolutely key that automation uh, doesn't mean that people are left behind and ultimately disenfranchised and potentially left out of a job. So that is a, a very important issue. I think the other issue that needs to be taken into account is how we get more women um, into to STEM uh, positions. I mean, sadly, the women only make up 19% of the tech workforce, uh, so we're not making the most uh, of it in terms of bringing women forward for these positions. And that goes all the way back to the school level. Uh, in 2012, in terms of computer-related subjects, the, the women made up 32% of the qualifications achieved, and that recently has deteriorated to nearly half to 18%. So that, that shows that there's a, there's a real issue there and not bringing through girls and young women into these positions. Uh, and that, I think we're lacking there for, to make the most uh, of our potential. So in summing up, De Deputy Presiding Officer, I think this is a massive issue uh, for the government, for the parliament, particularly looking ahead uh, to the 
uh, if you're looking to build a successful Scottish economy. Uh, what, it, what it requires is an overall strategy that may, ensures that we give uh, as many people access to the technology as possible so that they can contribute into the economy. And we ensure that we've got a joined up strategy running th through from schools, universities, and to employers to ensure that we have uh, people who are properly skilled to make the most of the advantages in the 21st uh, century. So I think this is an important debate, you know, with some big, big areas and big issues to discuss. Um, there are some real opportunities, but there are also some challenges we need to address. Thank you. And I'll now call on Patrick Harvey. Mr. Harvey, please. Thank you very much. Um, there is a savage irony for me as I uh, start to speak in this debate in that today, much against my better judgment, I was foolish enough to trust this thing with my notes and now the screen has frozen. Uh, it's unusable, so I'm going to have to wing it. I do remember that the first thing I was supposed to say was to draw attention to uh, the fact that I'm a member of the Open Rights Group, just as I did at the start of the, the debate three weeks ago. And I will be expanding uh, on some of the, the, the themes uh, in, in that debate that we touched on. There's a great deal of overlap. Uh, I, I think my experience with uh, the device in front of me uh, is a reminder of one of the first feelings of frustration that I had on being elected here and knowing that I would be locked in to a Microsoft uh, environment not one which I would have chosen, rather than members of this parliament being given the option uh, to spend a, a fixed budget on IT and meet their own needs, we're told that we have to live within a walled garden. Uh, and, and that is, that is uh, clearly still a frustration for me. I don't know if others are experiencing the same. I'll give way. Are you offering to unfreeze something here, no? Uh, it, Mr. Carson. Tried, uh, rebooting it. Uh, no, would the member agree that the feeling he's experiencing now is a feeling that's shared by many rural constituents, including two are sitting in the gallery today from a farming company that uh, they're experiencing on a daily basis when their internet connectivity goes down, and we need to accelerate that rollout. Mr Harvey. I certainly recognise that frustration, uh, and one of the, the arguments that I put in the last debate, and I put it again now, uh, is that while we should be concerned that everyone has adequate access, I, I think the obsession with the idea that absolutely everybody in the country must have uh, super fast speeds. I'm not sure that I would prioritize uh, somebody in, in my street in Partick getting super fast speeds uh, rather than people in other parts of the country getting what's good enough. And I do think that we need some discussion about what's good enough in terms of access uh, to networks and access to broadband rather than thinking that if people don't have 30 meg connections, they're somehow digitally deprived. But that rollout, that uptake, that ability to access networks is not the only thing that we should be debating. And I want to raise three broad themes. One is on uh, the impact on the workplace. One is on the framework of laws that protect things like copyrights and patents. Uh, and the other is on a digital rights agenda. James Kelly mentioned the, the impact of automation on people who may in future not have uh, a job uh, or certainly not have a job that pays them uh, a, a livable and secure, reliable income. That's something that we've been debating on a number of occasions, and in particular, the impact of the gig economy and employment standards there. The vulnerability that people can live with when their income is temperamental or unpredictable, or when the companies that operate the platforms on which they, they get access to their work uh, don't treat themselves as having employers' responsibilities towards them. They may not be doing tech work. They no, may not feel that they're working in a tech industry, but if they're working across a platform tech provided by a tech business, uh, they're affected by it. And we see a great many people uh, effectively working for significantly less uh, than the, the, the minimum wage, let alone the living wage, uh, or indeed not having any security around uh, holiday entitlement, sick leave, and, and so on. There's a whole host of, of workplace protection issues there. But even for the big tech businesses, there are also uh, issues. And I will mention our neighbors, Rockstar North, in this context. I mention them in particular only because they've had some recent negative press attention uh, in terms 
uh, of workplace issues. And I do want to recognise that amongst that press attention there have been some individuals quoted saying things are getting better. They've been conscious about the need to improve. But that consciousness about the need to improve does remind us that big tech industries can often and have often been very exploitative in expecting huge amounts of overtime, including unpaid overtime, uh, particularly in, in what's uh, called in the, in the games industry the crunch period, the, the, the final frantic phase of development of a, of a new game or other product uh, where people are expected to work way over above and beyond the contracted hours. Now, we do want a fair economy. We do recognise that the Scottish Government has a fair work agenda. We do need to think about what are the new aspects of that agenda that have to develop in relation to the tech industries uh, and the digital economy. The second theme I wanted to talk about is what is generally loosely called intellectual property. And I, I've used that phrase myself and I've, uh, I, I think, been persuaded now that it is a, a, a confusing term. We should be talking differently about copyright, patent and other forms uh, of uh, trade protection, trade secret protection, trademark protection. They have different purposes. And in particular, in, in relation to copyright, as we see copyright and patent both being used in different ways in relation to software, we should be asking, are these the right forms of protection? Are they actually stimulating genuine innovation or are they merely protecting those who own one of these walled gardens, whether they serve us well or serve us poorly on any one day? Is the copyright and patent framework the right way uh, to achieve the maximum social benefit? Because it shouldn't just be about maximizing the profit of intellectual property owners, it should be about maximizing the social benefit and the social utility that comes from creativity. I, I don't think that the uh, arguments on, on copyright uh, ought to be playing out in the same way in relation to the latest Hollywood blockbuster as they do in relation to a piece of code. But it does seem to me that what we're at the moment doing is using a, a legal framework which protects the profitability of the biggest businesses and the owners of the most profitable bits of IP, and we're not protecting uh, those who want to earn an ordinary living doing creative work, whether in the, in the digital industries or elsewhere, uh, we're not necessarily doing that or stimulating the, the greatest uh, creation of, of creative goods or dissemination of creative goods. So we do need a fundamental debate, uh, and it has to be in, on an international basis, about the reform of intellectual property laws. And finally, presiding officer, on digital rights, something I've spoken of in the past. I'm pleased that the Labour Amendment uses the phrase digital democracy because there are fundamental questions in the wake of the deliberate hacking of the democratic process, both here and in the US and in other countries. Uh, you know, even analog democracy can be hacked digitally, and we need to be looking at a whole host of digital rights in relation to privacy, surveillance, uh, and the operation of basic democratic systems. These are unanswered questions as yet, and I don't expect the government to have all of the answers, but they need to be on the agenda rather than simply seeing this as one uh, of growth, 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 growth. Thank you, President. Thank you. I think I need a footnote for analog democracy, but somebody may. Thank you very much. Bits of paper with X's on it. That's my language. Uh, I now call on Mike Rumbles. Mr. Rumbles, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The first line of the Scottish Government's motion today makes it clear that Parliament should recognise the benefits of the digital economy to every business, every region and every citizen of Scotland. I'd be surprised if there is anyone in the Chamber who doesn't see the huge benefits to be had from promoting our digital economy by connecting businesses and individuals, developing new technologies with innovation, education and creating new skills and high-paid jobs who can and should take advantage of changing global markets. But none of that matters one jot if it's not backed up by world-class digital infrastructure. And for many people living in rural and remote communities, and the feeling is that they've been simply left behind. Now, the minister knows that in places like Aberdeenshire and in her own constituency in the Highlands and Islands, Communities, communities have not had anywhere near the same level of access to the technological revolution that some other areas have. In fact, the number of people without access to broadband in Aberdeenshire is second only to the minister's own region 
the Highlands and Islands. And Citizens Advice report that around four in 10 rural consumers have had problems with their broadband signal in the past year. I want to know from the Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to deliver on its commitment to connect the thousands of homes and businesses that have been left behind. Minister. That. And I, if I could answer it in two points. The first is the, the member will know about our commitment backed up with £600 million to connect 100% of properties to superfast broadband. If he knows it well in his constituency, I know it even better in my constituency about the frustration and the need to see that delivered. But the second question that I would throw back to Mr Rumbles, which I asked him in the participation debate that we had, was that, in, in light of the quote I, I, I had earlier, even when there is connectivity, we need to do more to support the skills and the businesses and the citizens to make the most of digital. How does he propose we do that where there is infrastructure over 95, for over 95 per cent of the country? Mr Rumble. Yes, but we've got to make sure we don't put the cart before the horse. It's useful to have the infrastructure before we can actually talk about all the other things that we need to progress this whole thing. If you haven't got the infrastructure in the first place, how can you possibly address what needs to be done? And quite frankly, I have to say, the R100 programme, I mean, the Scottish, well, you, we're halfway through this parliament and the minister must know that progress has been glacial to get everybody connected. We are now at the 11th hour of the Scottish government's election promise. Oh, we hear murmuring from the SNP backbenchers. They promised for 2021 to achieve 100% coverage by May 2021. And Fergus Ewing has often said in this chamber, Amazingly, suddenly that, that target date of May 2021 has moved to December 2021. Yep. Finlay Carson. Intervention. Would the member agree with me? It's utterly ridiculous that uh, the, the SNP government are going back in the commitment to delivering a roadmap uh, in July next year just to give businesses a, a, a level of security that uh, fast broadband is going to come to them. Mike Rumbles. The member makes an absolutely good point. I mean, BT has said that 100% coverage is achievable. It is achievable, but will require what they call unparalleled partnership and collaboration between the contracted supplier, the Scottish government, and Scottish public sector, communities, business, and citizens. Unparalleled, not glacial. That is not the level of effort we're seeing from the Scottish government on this matter. As technology develops and digital connectivity becomes an ever important if not essential part of modern life. It's vital that connectivity is reliable and digital infrastructure keeps up with the rest of the country. I believe that rural areas have the most to gain, the most to gain from digital inclusion, both economically and socially, and that good connectivity is the answer to some of the challenges of rural living. Now, the Scottish Government's own research shows that four-fifths of Scottish businesses say that digital technology is essential or important to the future growth or competitiveness of their business. And improving Scotland's digital infrastructure was identified by the Federation of Small Business as the second top small business priority. Why would that be any different for rural areas? Fast and reliable access to the internet and a dependable mobile phone signal is no longer a luxury. Good connectivity is now an essential service. There are, of course, other things the Scottish Government can do to improve the situation for those that already have reasonable access. How fortunate are they? Such as upskilling workers, I mean the Minister asked before, upskilling workers as job markets change and businesses embrace new technologies, automation and even artificial intelligence. It could also help, the Scottish Government could also help by supporting UK and international efforts to strengthen the domestic and international regulation of the big tech companies in the interests of consumers. However, for rural communities who are at the back of the queue, none of that will have a meaningful impact until the infrastructure is in place. And at the moment, the only answer is to wait for public investment and commercial operators to fill the gap and wait and wait we do, by which time the rest of the country will have moved forward again. Marvelous for some of the cities in Glasgow and Edinburgh. While I support the motion before us today, it is not the motion that I would have been brought forward. And I'm disappointed, I understand the reasons, we can't challenge why amendments aren't taken, and there are our own reasons for that. But I, 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 I am disappointed them 
that, that were debating the motion before us today and the amendments, I think, could have been written somewhat in a stronger focus. I urge the Scottish Government to focus not on warm words, which we see in the motions and amendments indeed before us, about our digital economy, but to, to demonstrate, to demonstrate some real progress for our rural communities by completing the 100% coverage by the date they said they would do in their manifesto at the last election. Thank you. Open debate. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me start by declaring my membership of the Institution of Ele uh, Engineering and Technology. I'm a fellow at the Royal Society of the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce, and I'm a professional member of the Association for Computing Machinery. And in relation to some of the history, that last one is perhaps uh, in some ways the most important because on the 9th of December 1968, at a meeting of the ACM, Douglas Engelbart demonstrated a system which had windows, hypertext, graphics, video conferencing, and it showed the first mouse in action. And there's actually a video of that demonstration you can see uh, on the internet today. Now, the motion uh, that we have before us from the, 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 the government uh, talks about uh, the need to harness public and private sector. And it's worth just uh, visiting the history of how we got here today. Uh, the public sector played a very important part in the digital uh, developments that we uh, benefit from today. Tommy Flowers, who is an engineer at the Dollars Hill uh, lab of the post office during the last war, actually using his own money, developed the first electronic computer. He scrounged a huge number of electronic valves and produced a computer for use at Bletchley Park against the recommendation of the person who was running the place and so contributed enormously uh, to the war effort. The commercial company that was Lions uh, Tea Shops uh, produced the first commercial computer which ran its first uh, transactions in 1951. So the history that we have encompassed in today's motion uh, is a long-standing one requiring both the public and private sectors uh, to work, uh, work together. Now, of course, digital uh, way of expressing data is uh, very long held. It was Leibniz in 1679 who came up with a binary system. It was George Boole who introduced Boolean algebra, which underlies much of it in 1847. Uh, the first digital electronic circuit into Edinburgh was installed in 1868. That was a telegraph circuit that connected the Bank of Scotland's head office in Edinburgh to its uh, office in London. Uh, the bank incidentally installed its first telephone in 1881. Uh, the board said it could only be done on the strict understanding it not be used to conduct business. Some, he will. Mr. Can I get to the substance of the debate this afternoon? I was just mulling that over myself. I'm looking for the historic reference in the government's motion. Well, I, I, I hope, for colleagues, that uh, line five of the government motion, which says wider public sector and private sector is the most effective way of improving digital uh, capabilities, is perhaps uh, relevant to some of the remarks I've made so far. But... Let us move on to today, uh, presiding officer, and the important things we have, we have to do uh, to deliver uh, the modern uh, world in which uh, everyone can benefit from the adoption of digital technologies. Now, we know that uh, about 2% of our workforce uh, is employed in the digital economy. Um, we heard from James Kelly in particular, I think, about the gender uh, discrepancy there is in the industry and he's right to say that although interestingly when I started in 1969 it was more or less 50 50 uh, what hap seems to have happened is when the BBC computer was launched in 1981 parents gave the computer to the sons and the family and actually you can see in the graph a couple of years after that the gender bias moves dramatically towards men. So sometimes there are cultural issues as well as government uh, policies. But women will be very welcome in this industry and I hope that they will join the over 60,000 people who, who, are, who are working uh, in uh, computers today. 
Now, the important thing is getting infrastructure in place. Now, Mike Rumbles wants us to cut the implementation period of the R100 programme from the 549 days it will have for implementation um, if we follow the government's programme to 334 uh, days uh, if it's to be delivered uh, on the schedule that Mike Rumbles wants. So that's quite a substantial uh, downlift. And of course, you can't simply squeeze projects into smaller spaces uh, without uh, the taking risks. The non-commutativity of time and effort applies to the project. Uh, you illustrate that by thinking if it takes... A, I'll just finish this wee bit and then I will. Um, if you think of a grave digger dig, digging a grave and it takes them six hours, it simply doesn't mean that six grave diggers can do it in one hour. I'll now, if I may. Edward Mountain. Uh, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I'm somewhat confused. It was quite clear in the government's programme that broadband R100 would be delivered by the next election. That's what they stood on the last election for. And in fact, that's what the First Minister said up until January this year. Then she started to change, and it wasn't until uh, Fergus Ewing changed his position, which happened in about March, that the First Minister then changed her position, which, if I remember rightly, was in about July. So I think the people in Scotland are only expecting R100 to be rolled out by May 2021, which is what we were originally promised. I, I don't understand what the observation is. Perhaps the member could explain it to me. Mr uh, Stevenson, I'll give you your time back. I, I, th I think the member should consider that it's better to set a realistic time scale in the light... You've got uh, do forgive me, colleagues. I'm not rebutting a single word the colleague is saying about previous intentions. I'm making the very substantial point that when you're rolling out to the last 5%, it's a huge programme to undertake and you need to have the right amount of time to get it right. And any government who uh, fails to uh, deliver on a project that they've then set out, uh, I think will quite properly uh, find themselves uh, in, a, in a difficult position. Now, presenting officer, you've generously given me a little time back, but let me not uh, over, -egg, uh, over egg the pudding. We have 120,000 or so uh, homes in Scotland that we have to uh, deliver the R100 uh, programme to. But I think it's correctly been said the infrastructure of communication is merely the scaffolding upon which you can then build the propositions that actually deliver value. Getting people who are not digitally capable up to a different place in society through libraries and public spaces and the education system, converting private and government business to do digital delivery, that's all part of what we, uh, we have to do uh, as well. So I certainly look forward personally to getting my super fast broadband delivered by fiber. And if the last 5% is by fiber, as I guess it will be, we'll actually be ahead of the cities for the first time. Thank Fingers you, please crossed. conclude. Thank you, Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Willie Coffey, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, following that speech, I will try to remain in the modern world in which we're all forced to live. Um, we heard evidence during the Economy Committee inquiry into Scotland's economic performance. Uh, we'll hear more about that, of course, on Thursday. But we heard then that no sectors are exempt from digital disruption and that many face an innovator-die scenario. Again, no uh, reference or attempt to echo one of Stuart Stevenson's comments there in his speech. Indeed, we heard that manufacturing companies who were embracing new technology were thriving, and those that were not were finding it more challenging to grow. Now, it is clear that Scotland needs to harness the opportunities brought about by technological developments, and also not be left behind by our competitors. But in too many areas, we are not equipped in this country to take full advantage of new technologies. Uh, it is, for example, particularly disappointing to note the results of the 2017 Digital Economic Business Survey, which showed that only one in four businesses think that their employees have the necessary digital skills to meet business needs. And that was down on the figure from the same survey from 37% in 2014. To make the most of the digital revolution, it is not good enough to simply have the infrastructure without the skills and some have touched on this already. 
Making greater use of those skills and using online data has been linked with an 8% rise in productivity, and we badly need productivity in this country. Witnesses to the inquiry of the committee were left frustrated by what they saw as continued skill shortages for technological firms in Scotland. BT said that they hoped the national shortage in computer science teachers in Scottish schools could be addressed so that we can produce a workforce for the digital future. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservative Amendment today highlights the need for the Scottish Government to work together with the UK Government to make the most of opportunities provided by the UK industrial strategy and other initiatives. That industrial strategy is ambitious for the teaching of computing in schools in other parts of the UK and commits 84 million pounds over a five year period for a comprehensive program to improve the teaching of computing and drive up participation in computer science. The Scottish Government must take action in this regard and halt the 25% decline in computing teaching numbers that has been seen over the past decade and a bit. And likewise, as the need for these skills increases, it is important not to leave others behind. We often look ahead to the future with trepidation as new technology that we enjoy replaces the need for lower skilled work. And as downturns happen in certain sectors such as oil and gas, people find that the lack of a dynamic approach towards skills provision renders them stuck in a particular field, competing for a shrinking number of jobs. And there is also an, an acknowledgement that most skills interventions focus on younger generations and less so on reskilling people so that they can contribute to the modern digital economy as they may have to a past type of economy. The industrial strategy acknowledges that new economy and the changes that will be required to support it. It commits to a national retraining scheme, which the Chancellor recently announced he would fund with 100 million pounds, including digital skills courses using artificial intelligence. The Scottish Government is playing catch up in this area, but has announced a national retraining partnership in its latest programme for government, and that is to be welcomed. But it needs to be pursued without any further delay, given the pace of technological change. It is about embracing the future here in Scotland, giving people the skills they need to thrive in a new environment and supporting employers to adapt. And as we move into that future, Edinburgh and the wider Lothian region will be playing a key role. As a Lothian MSP, I welcome the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region deal, which is an example of what can be achieved in the digital age if the two governments and others work together. £1.3 billion pounds being invested, which aims, amongst other things, to turn the region into the data capital of Europe, a commodity which is so fundamental to the digital economy. The Edinburgh University hub at Easter Bush will be just one of the beneficiaries from the deal and will work towards meeting a challenge that is global in nature, but affects us directly here in Scotland. Using digital agriculture or agritech as it's called, it will seek to boost efficiency in the sector by collating a wide range of data that will be able to determine the right food species, the right products, in the right field at the right time to maximize agricultural productivity, helping to increase global food supply at a time when it is estimated that agricultural production needs to increase by 50% by 2050. Easterbush and other projects that make up the Edinburgh Region deal build on the tech expertise we already have present in this region. There were 363 tech startups that incorporated in Edinburgh in 2017 alone. So there is reason to be excited in this region and for Scotland to be a productive and innovative digital economy for the future. But more needs to be done to ensure there are the skills required to do so. Thank you very much, Mr. Linters. Call Willie, Willie Coffey to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr. Coffey, please. Thanks very much, President Officer. The two main issues for me that face Scotland and pressing forward with our digital ambitions are one, getting the computing size software development skills that we need, and two, 
continuing to find a way to participate in the digital single market in Europe post-Brexit. Uh, we know that the digital economy is the fastest growing sector worldwide and this will not stop any time soon. Uh, we think it's worth about £5 billion to the economy mentioned earlier by the Minister and there are around 100,000 technical professionals working in the industry just now. The Cabinet Secretary's vision to take this to 150,000 over the next four or five years is to be welcomed and is aimed to reach out to schools and to encourage more females to choose science and computing is absolutely essential if we're to even keep pace with the demand for software skills. If we look at some of the figures coming from industry in Scotland, we see that more than half of the demand is for technology skills, and about 70% of that demand is for software development skills. So it's good to see a number of initiatives to support this. The Digital Skills Programme, the Digital Development Fund, things like Code Clan, Digital Extra, they're all examples of different types of interventions that are making a difference. The other key area I mentioned is the digital single market in Europe and what our participation or association with this will look like post-Brexit. The European digital single market is one of the biggest trade markets for online digital services. Estimated that spending online in Europe is worth about 500 billion euros and that's expected to double incredibly by 2020. It's also crucial to think about how the UK and Scotland can continue to share in or work alongside that digital market sector that's worth about £400 billion a year to the European economy, supporting hundreds of thousands of jobs. But worryingly, President Officer, there's not even a mention of it in the UK government proposal document issued last week, nor is there even a mention of it in the industrial strategy that was mentioned in the debate earlier. This digital single market has three main pillars or, or aims. Access to online products and services, setting the right conditions for digital services and networks to thrive, and growing the digital economy. It will allow consumers to access all of their digital content right across Europe at no extra cost if you're still in the single market. There will be no geographic blocking of your data and applications anymore if you're still in the market and it will continue to allow consumers to use their mobile phones across Europe with no roaming charges applying, if you're still in the market. Now, the question is, what's Scotland's and the UK's role in all of this to be? The consumer experience is crucial. If this isn't resolved, then people from Scotland and the UK will get none of these benefits, will get all of the costs and restrictions as soon as they set foot in Europe. For business, it will be much worse it will mean that Scottish and UK businesses cannot compete for and offer digital services within that market. And that will be a huge disadvantage to them because of that exclusion. It's time, I think, that we heard from industry about this so that some kind of sensible arrangement can be put in place before it's too late. For any politician claiming that it's a good thing to leave such a market or not to have any relationship with it at all, really needs to think again about the damage they are about to do. Now, I don't really want to take members back in time to the late 1970s when I studied and graduated in computer science, but some of the key issues then are still with us now, and that is how do we get more young women to take up careers in this amazing industry? And that was touched on by James Kelly earlier. I mentioned earlier in the Cabinet the Cabinet Secretary's welcome intention to reach out and encourage youngsters at school, particularly girls, to take up software careers. It's a well-paid profession, presiding officer, higher than most other sectors, usually full-time, and allows those with the right skills to work anywhere in the world in some of the most exciting areas of development, from film, animation, games technology, to systems to help our NHS or to manage data and services across a huge range of public and private sectors. No area of business and industry can succeed without good software development. And we need good software developers to build all these systems of the future. The journey has to start early at primary school and there has to be an almost continual focus on it to give us a realistic chance of success. When I meet youngsters from the many schools in my constituency who come to Parliament, I usually ask them who wants to work 
in software development when they graduate. And the numbers are still worryingly low, presiding officer. And there, I think, lies the challenge to excite those young minds about the potential they have and what they can achieve is what we have to do, I think, if we want them to join this wonderful industry. So, presiding officer, the challenges in front of us are formidable. On the one hand, the commitments the Scottish Government is making are clear and we can see the road ahead. Keeping pace with technological change and demands will be challenge enough, but pushing ahead and making Scotland a leader in the digital economy is our aim, but is not entirely in our gift. On the other, the sooner that level heads and individuals in the UK Government with some technical knowledge about digital technology have their say and can affect a change of approach in relation to the digital single market in Europe, the better for us all. Thank you. Daniel Johnson, followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think the timing of this debate is very apt, because at a point in time when the whole of UK politics seems to be focused and obsessed with whether or not the Prime Minister's deal will get passed through Parliament, we're having a debate by, on a topic that I think we need to be talking about, which is technology change. And that is the problem with Brexit. At a very time when we have to be facing up the realities of technology and how that's going to change the world of work, we're focused on uh, issues which I think are only going to be a distraction and prevent us from doing so. In December 2016, I think Mark Carney gave a very important speech about just how important these changes are and the need to face up to them from a policy perspective. In that speech, he, he uh, said that the fundamental challenge is that alongside its great benefits, every technological revolution mercilessly destroys jobs and livelihoods. And he went on to basically point out that that includes, and especially uh, in this latest wave of technology change, service jobs that I think so many professional people have until now thought were preserved and not subject to the sorts of changes that we've seen in other industries. Did I think it's sometimes this debate, I think, gets caught between those who say that we all need to fear the rise of the robots and learn to love our new robot masters, and those who say that nothing's changed and this is just a, another technological wave and we've always coped with it in the past. The reality, I think, is somewhere in between. But there are some things which I think are different this time around, and I think fundamentally, from a policy perspective, we have to face up with. One is pace. I think we've seen it in recent technology changes where industries simply within a matter of years find themselves irrelevant. I, I think the record industry is a very good one where in a matter of years they found their whole business model completely irrelevant. But there's also, I think, the, 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 the manner of the technology change. We're now dealing with technologies which have cognitive functions, technologies which are able to make assessments and decisions. And with that, and in the, coupled with robotics, we have technology change, which has the very real prospect of displacing entire supply chains. Entire supply chains which will no longer need human input. From the very point at which an item is produced through to its delivery to the consumer, will be able to be taken place by robotics, by artificial intelligence, and without any human input. That's the reality of the challenge that's in front of us. But the good news is, and I think other uh, members have made reference to this, we have some of the ingredients we need to take advantage of this. This city in particular, I think without anyone really noticing in the last few years, has become a major technology hub. Now, I don't need to repeat the numbers that other, others have said. Well, our, the, 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 I think the key figure is the one that the minister quoted, that the, the, the uh, number of jobs in Edinburgh uh, in technology has increased at three times the rate of the UK average. And I think recognition needs to be given to the university. And other members have, have again pointed out, but the informatics department in Edinburgh University is the largest department in Europe. It is a major international hub. And what's more, it has been at the very heart of technology startup. And this city now has thousands of people working in technology startups. And that is a real success story, and but one that we need to learn from so that the whole of this country can benefit from the same things. And at the very heart of that is about people, people with the right skills and knowledge, talented people skilled at the right level. It's also about investment, though, and there's not enough discussion in this debate so far about investment. Because if you look at countries and systems that have uh, dealt with these things successfully, government-backed investment has been at the heart of it. Whether you look at DARPA in the United States, Tekes in Finland, the Taiwan Technology Institute, 
Behind them all is the very fact that government sometimes needs to step in and take the risks that the private sector cannot, even in a country like America. But the other is scale and form. When you look at those startups, they're very often not uh, uh, of the form that we might be used to. These are very often people even working from coffee shops with laptops. That's all you need in the technology-based uh, uh, industries of the future. You do not necessarily need big factories or big offices. $20,000 robots mean that you can produce things in a garage at the same cost efficiencies as a big corp multinational corporation in a factory. Now, these are the realities and the changes that technology mean. And these are the things that we must make sure that our infrastructure and our public policy allow us to take advantage of those things rather than being left behind. And I think we can. But there is a real challenge here. And I come from uh, uh, an industry which has already seen, I think, many of the consequences of automation. Prior to coming into Parliament, I worked in retail. And I think we all know the, the, the issues faced on the high street. And while we might not call that automation, it is very much the same factors that lie behind that. And the lessons are there, and we need to learn them now. Because I think that the reality is, is that every business needs to become a tech business. Every worker, every person working in every company needs to understand their job and the application of technology to it. So I worry when people talk about 2% of people work in technology. The reality is, is that 100% of the workforce needs to be able to understand and apply technologies. Because the reality is, according to McKinsey, uh, that 36% of jobs in the workplace could be replaced. In, in some industries, such as the transport and distribution, that's up to 77%. And that's an industry that employs 5% of the workforce. And indeed, in Scotland, we should learn the, the lessons from our own recent past. We have cities and areas in this country which have simply yet to recover from previous technology changes, whether that's the steel industry, shipbuilding industry, jute. And if you look at the areas reliant on those industries in the past, we still have much higher levels of uh, uh, underutilization of working age population. And we need to learn those lessons lest we suffer them again in the future. So briefly in conclusion, we need to address the skills agenda. Our skills uh, uh, regime needs to be as much, if not more, about reskilling people than it is about giving people skills at the start of their working lives. I think the emphasis is too much in terms of college, universities and apprenticeships on young people leaving school. It needs to be just as much about older people. It is about education, teachers, investment, support for innovation and above all, uh, making sure that our city economies are at the very heart of our economy and that needs to go much more far beyond city deals. That's about making our cities work together. I think the big missed opportunity of the city deals is that we've got separate ones for our uh, Scottish cities rather than one cohesive strategy for our cities. And I'll end there. Thank you. Okay. Stuart McMillan, followed by Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Officer. Uh, Officer, I just want to touch upon a couple of points that Daniel Johnson uh, just uh, spoke about. Uh, just his final comment just regarding the city deals. Now, just to remind Mr Johnson, the city deals are not solely about the cities. Uh, in my area, in, in the west of Scotland, it's about the Glasgow uh, regional deal. So it includes Inverclyde, Western Bartonshire, Eastern Bartonshire and other areas. So it's not solely about the cities. Now, I, I do appreciate Mr, uh, Mr. Johnson does represent a city, but I don't. Uh, and the second point is uh, his point uh, regarding uh, the issue of uh, government investment. Now, Mr. Johnson will be very much aware of the £280 million um, investment from the, uh, the total contribution from across the public sector of Scotland uh, regarding the digital Scotland Superfast broadband scheme, but also the, the £600 million investment, <coughs> £600 million investment by the Scottish Government in the, the R100 uh, programme, which does seek to, to uh, promote and pro sorry, provide access to superfast broadband to all homes and businesses. So clearly, uh, this Scottish Government, uh, just, just one more point, uh, clearly this Scottish Government actually have been putting in an investment, but I do agree with them that business does need to do more. I'll take intervention. Excuse me, Daniel Johnson. I, I agree with the member's points, but I sometimes worry that the debate focuses on connection to uh, the internet and rather than looking beyond it and it's about growing uh, businesses within the technology space and that's where there is a real and a bigger role for government I believe. Stuart McMillan. Uh, I mean that's a, that's a valid point uh, but at the same time uh, I mean if people aren't connected in the first place then there's clearly uh, there's clearly some type of a deficit there for them 
and these particular businesses, particularly smaller ones, which I'm going to touch upon in a moment, to actually progress their business interests. Now, prior to the, the SNP Scottish Government's intervention, the superfast broadband coverage in my Greenwich and Clyde constituency was below 80%. And come the end of 2017, it was up to 96.2%. And by 2021, every home and business in Scotland will actually have that access to superfast broadband thanks to that £600 million. Pounds, uh, just one second. Thanks to that £600 million pounds of investment. It, it is the biggest public investment ever made in a UK broadband project. Finlay Carson. Could uh, the member maybe remind the chamber whether the investment in broadband with the Scottish Government and this current budget went up or went down? Because if you can't remember, I can actually uh, help him with that. Stuart McMillan. Down. Well, uh, Mr Carson, I'm going to come on to some of that point in a wee moment tonight, because I think you will need to listen uh, when I do come on to it. But saying also, well, these figures actually indicate that things are looking good and have improved for, for Inverclyde. There are still pockets in my constituency that are not included in the rollout. Now, consequently, I've been contacted uh, by a local business uh, who is actually considering closing due to the poor broadband speeds that they are receiving. Outdoor Spares Limited, based in Lindock Industrial Estate in Greenock, not a rural part of my constituency, but a town, have tried numerous ways to improve their broadband speed over the last few years. And this is, is because of the, the two BT open reach cabinets which, services, which service businesses and also homes in the area. And only one is fibre enabled uh, and can provide ultra fast broadband. Now, the other cabinet 64, which Outdoor Spares Limited are serviced by, was not enabled during the last rollout. Now, Ian Homer, uh, who owns Outdoor Spares Limited, waited to see whether cabinet 64 but actually one of the first to be upgraded in the current and final phase of the R100. Uh, now, it's now almost 2019, and Ian's business is still struggling uh, to operate due to uh, the abysmal broadband speeds. In September of this year, Ian said that uh, he started to work from home more as the broadband speeds in the industrial estate aren't suitable for running his business, which is an online shop supplying a range of spare parts, plus accessories for Mountfield, Steel, Partner, Makita, Honda, and Flymo retailers. Now, well, his business uh, growing, uh, well, his business has been growing in the past, but not knowing whether uh, the rollout will actually reach him uh, next month or in two years' time, Ian is actually finding it difficult to actually plan for his business for the future, unless those plans involve locating elsewhere. Now, this is, would result in local jobs being lost, all over poor broadband speeds. Now, a quick survey of other tenants within the Linda Industrial Estate uh, shows that some are getting speeds of around 50 megabyte download, uh, to one to three upload, which is what Ian would actually get on a good day. Now, this means that he doesn't qualify for the UK government's better broadband subsidy scheme. So he's straddled with broadband speeds that are not conducive to growing uh, and never mind a web-related business. Now, presenting officer, the last thing Inverclyde needs is for people thinking that we are not able to support technology-based businesses, when actually we can, we, we have done, we can, and we will do even more so in the future. But digital technology doesn't just benefit tech companies. It enables all kinds of businesses to, to engage with customers directly, to develop new processes and products, and also to sell those products to a global market 24 hours a day at a relatively low cost. Now, it's crucial then that the industrial estates, which house dozens of businesses, are not left until last in this rollout, otherwise constituencies like my own will actually suffer. The second example I want to touch upon is our given trout fishery. It's another local business who approached me about their uh, poor broadband speeds. Now, why are they important uh, in terms of this kind of wider discussion? Because they, they are very important for the local tourism market. They bring people into the Inverclyde to actually invest and spend money. Now, I recognise that some of Scotland's most challenging locations uh, elsewhere in parts of the country are more challenging than uh, my constituency. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, we still have uh, some rural parts, uh, as well as also some issues we've also got in this particular part of Greenock. Now, what this actually means for constituencies like mine in Greenock and Inverclyde, um, that actually have got both rural and agricultural-based businesses, who actually, who actually can't enjoy the efficient broadband speeds, uh, and they just simply cannot relocate. Now, I know that the Scottish Government is committed uh, to making Scotland the world-class digital nation. Uh, we are already well ahead of our European peers on superfast broadband coverage, take up on average speeds. Yep, sitting officer, I'm concerned 
uh, for local businesses and my constituency who are part of that 3.8% without the supervised broadband. Now, to answer uh, Mr Carson's uh, question... If you could do so quickly, please. Okay. The SNP government is picking up the slack after a lack of investment from previous Scottish governments, uh, sorry, executives, and the UK Conservative government is no better as their contribution to the R100 programme stands at a miserly 3% of the total investment. So, Mr. I would be message from Mr. Carson, please, Mr. Carson, talk to your colleagues in Westminster, get them to up their game, get them to put more money in, so not only your constituency, but mine, can have a better result in terms of the economy. Thank you very much. Jamie Halcrow Johnson, followed by Alec Neil. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate, which allows us to focus on an area of crucial importance to Scotland's economic future. Uh, we've already heard um, from others of just some of the prospects for the growth of the digital economy here in Scotland. And this potential is significant, and it's right that we give this sector our attention today. In its position, uh, existing position, the growth value added by HEAD for Scotland's tech sector is some 60% higher than the economy as a whole. It's already making a disproportionate and effective contribution. Digital industries are al also employ highly skilled professionals with the added benefit of a market that has a global reach. We only need to look at some of the Scottish success stories to see what, they can, what can be achieved. But there are undoubtedly still opportunities to build on our existing strength and create a digital economy for the future. The enterprise and skill agencies have highlighted a number of areas of potential expansion. But a common thread is that each of these will require investment, and not simply financial investment, to lay the groundwork for future success. I'm not speaking just of small-scale interventions, how welcome they may be individually, but instead about all levels of government taking a serious look at how we create the foundations for growth and expansion in the years and decades to come. So I'd implore the Scottish Government and its agencies to work closely with industry, to work closely with other governments at local and UK level, and to support the change we need to see. Later this week, this chamber will also be discussing the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee's report uh, into Scotland's economic performance, a committee I sit on. I raise this as a number of the conclusions are relevant to how we look at support, uh, to support particular sectors and businesses. One element, yeah, I'll brief into it, yeah. Stuart McMillan. I thank Mr. Halford Johnson for taking the intervention. Uh, will he uh, agree with me that the UK government should actually increase their investment into, uh, certainly into the R100 broadband scheme to actually help Scotland's economy? Jamie Halford Johnson. I think investment's key into this, but uh, I think the idea that the, that, uh, the member suggesting that somehow that the Scottish Government um, is, is either about to or going to deliver on the commitments it's made and repeated again and again and again. And I have to say, as somebody who represents the Highlands and Islands, the picture created by the benches over there is very different to the picture that's being delivered in that area. Um, one element I, in particular that I would highlight in, is the committee's work around regional growth. The jobs that technology can support are often so, uh, not geographically tied as the industries of the past were. Where the conditions are right, the tech sector can be an engine of growth, providing and supporting local economic hubs in regions like mine. The next Silicon Glen could be based in the Highlands, or in one of our island communities, or Connectivity Coast in Murray, perhaps. Um, I've not trademarked that, so the Minister is very welcome to suggest that to the Highlands and Islands Enterprise, or not, as the case may be. Uh, that's achievable if there is a willingness for government to work collaboratively with existing local organisations like colleges and universities. However, there are other key elements which need to be in place. I've spoken at some length about the connectivity problems my region faces. These are unfortunately stark. The Highlands and Islands region contains within, its, it, within it the majority of the worst performing, areas for, uh, per, worst performing areas for broadband download speeds in the entire UK. In our previous debate about digital inclusion, I pointed to a number of these cases and the problems that have pre presented themselves in my region for some time. It is unfortunately a blunt fact that for much of the rural highlands and islands, digital exclusion rather than inclusion is the norm. If the technology sector is to be the driver of regional growth rather than of deepening regional inequality, then those barriers will have to be broken down and those many years of exclusion reversed. And as a skilled, wor and a skilled workforce is also essential, I'll be generous to ministers in saying that a number of positive examples and projects have been demonstrated in recent years. Much of it has been private sector led or supported. A problem, however, is, in the, is learning the lessons from these projects and scaling them up uh, and expanding their reach. We are also disappointingly in a position where more than half of our population is at a distance from this sector. We've spoken previously about the gender pay gap in the tech sector and it remains stubborn. And others have highlighted women who 
comprise, sorry, just under half of the general workforce, only account for under a fifth of employment in tech roles. Not only, we, uh, not only are opportunities being lost, but so too are the skills and abilities of many of Scotland's people. I welcome the additional routes created into STEM learning that has been offered by foundation and graduate level apprentices, apprenticeships. With foundation apprenticeships particularly, there is a real chance to provide proper job-based introduction into the sectors of this type, which can serve a young person well throughout their career. But again, there is work to be done. I've raised several times with the minister's colleague uh, the priority that must be given to ensuring that the range of foundation apprenticeship frameworks are accessible across Scotland's council areas and regions. And I sincerely hope these steps are being taken and taken quickly. Another element is, of course, the continuing gender gap in STEM subject choices and STEM training. It does not need repeating in detail, but it's clear to me that at least that it necessitates a better approach to careers guidance and greater connections between schools, employers, colleges and universities at an early stage. Because even today, the skills gap diminishes our ability to grow this sector. Figures acquired by Skills Development Scotland demonstrate that 82% of employers in digital industries struggle to recruit people with the technical skills and expertise that are needed by their businesses. Around two thirds have also reported finding skilled staff as a barrier to their expansion. That strikes me as one of our most significant obstacles to success here. The glint of light is that we're having this debate here today in government time and that this research and analysis is available through the work of particularly the enterprise and skills agencies. Appreciating problems may be the first step towards addressing them, but as with connectivity, often the response can be slow. Presiding officer, as we look with a keener focus towards innovation and productivity in our economy, we must surely recognize that this sector can be a key component in delivering in these areas. We have to see, but we have to see real and sustained ambition if we are to create the conditions for our digital industries to thrive. And that's particularly the case outside of the central belt. Alex Neil, followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I say there's been a lot of very good points made in this debate. I think particularly the points made by Daniel Johnson uh, were well made. But one of the things I think we should be very careful of, and that is that although there are major challenges in terms of the number of jobs that will be lost, as the McKinsey report, which Daniel referred to, indicated that the net impact, if we seize the opportunities, is that we could end up both with more jobs and better jobs and better paid jobs. So the real challenge for all of us right across the benches and for the Scottish Government and for the private sector and for the training agencies and enterprise agencies, how do we make sure that we not only participate in the digital revolution, that we, we actually exploit the opportunities to the maximum. One of the mistakes we could make is by looking at the digital industry sector as one industry. It's not actually one industry. It's made up of a whole number of industries. And I want to pinpoint three in particular where I think there are huge opportunities for us in Scotland. One that's already been mentioned is the games industry, headquartered effectively in Dundee. And when I say headquartered in Dundee, I don't just mean the Scottish headquarters of the industry. Actually, in many respects, the global headquarters of the game industry is in Dundee. And the leading entrepreneur in the games industry in Scotland and internationally is Chris van der Keil. And he made an interesting observation earlier this year. He said, if we exploit the opportunities in the games industry, if we invest enough in the games industry in Scotland, we could end up employing as many people as worked in the North Sea oil and gas industry at its peak. That would be over 100,000 jobs in the games industry alone. And I think the government should sit down with Chris van der Keil and put together a plan to make that ambition happen. Because these jobs are exciting jobs. The number are growing, the sector is growing globally. Huge career opportunities, huge uh, payments in terms of the spin out to the rest of the economy and well paid jobs at that. The second sector within the digital framework is health and social care. We had the first class announcement last week jointly from the health service and the Health Directorate of the Scottish Government, along with Glasgow University, about art using artificial intelligence 
in the health service. And Scotland is ahead of the game again. But we've got to stay ahead of the game. And what that industry showed was the amount of money we could actually save in the health service by investing heavily in artificial intelligence. If we develop the artificial intelligence tools already available in principle, in a few years' time, with personalized, digitalized medicine, the health service will be able to predict what illnesses, what diseases individuals are likely to develop even before the symptoms show up in those particular patients. And the potential saving to the health service, but more importantly, the potential impact on patients will literally be revolutionary. So I would say to the minister, along with Jean Freeman, get together and let's have a hugely ambitious strategy focused in on health and social care as well. Not just health, but social care. And the third area where we have a presence and could do a lot more is in the cyber crime industry. Cyber crime is now a major challenge for business across the world. It's a major challenge for government across the world. And fighting cyber crime is now commanding huge budgets in the States, in Canada, in the UK, in Australia, and all around the world. The opportunity there is to develop the talents required to effectively fight cyber crime worldwide. And the people sitting in Glasgow in the companies already established fighting cyber crime are working in a global industry. The services they're providing remotely from Glasgow are counted in our export figures. These are huge opportunities. And one of the lessons we can learn is from the high-tech hotspots in America and from the triple helix in Norway, where they bring together in each of these gross sectors the public sector in terms of government and councils, the private sector in terms of those already operating, and academia. And by bringing those three sectors together, we already do it in the life sciences sector in Scotland. We effectively do it in parts of the renewable energy sector. We now need to do it in games technology. We need to do it in health and social care. We need to do it in cybercrime. And we need to do it in each of the other digital sectors where there are massive global Sorry, opportunities. Sorry? No, I'm not allowed to take it, no. No, right. That's an opportunity we'll need to miss. Uh, but uh, I think this, of all the industries that growing up in Scotland, this is the one with the greatest global opportunity. Let us join together. Forget the petty party politics about what month of the year next year R100 will be finished. Let's think big and act big and do it together. I'm sure I missed something very profound there, but perhaps some other time. <laughs> the last of the open debate contributions is Richard Lyle. I think it's called Let's Do It. It's always a pleasure to follow my uh, esteemed colleague, Mr. Neil. Can I begin my remarks this afternoon by welcoming the opportunity to contribute to this debate in developing Scotland's digital industries for our economic future? And I thank my colleague, the Minister, for bringing forward a debate which provides us the opportunity to talk about the investment delivered by this government in digital infrastructure and the role that it will surely play in terms of our economic policy. And it's on that investment I want to begin my remarks this afternoon, presiding officer, because some of the numbers and actions involved are tru truly impressive. From the launch of the Scottish Government's first Scotland-wide project, Internet of Things, IOT network last month, as part of a six million project. A new network which will provide a wireless sensor network for applications and services to collect data from devices and send that data without the need for 3G, 4G or Wi-Fi. Supporting businesses 
develop new and innovative applications, changing the way they work. The network will also en enable all businesses to have the ability to monitor the efficiency and productivity of their assets, equipment, scheduling, maintenance and improving production. This is an example of an innovative practice which could see, for example, IoT Scotland supporting the wider use of smart bins that wirelessly inform local authorities when they require emptying. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Ensuring best use of bin lorries, but also helping to reduce carbon emissions. Similarly, the network could monitor office environments to lower costs by saving energy while reducing carbon footprints of buildings. This techn technological investment delivers more than just intelligent working. It can and does have the potential to change the way we work especially as I've outlined in the terms of a local authority functions and making our way uh, of working smarter. Of course, this extends far beyond, beyond local authorities. This SNP group and this parliament want as many people and businesses to, to benefit from the transformative potential that the Internet of Things offers. This is a complement complemented al alongside our most recent programme for government. In the year ahead, we'll deliver and develop a range of activities across Scotland to inspire and enthuse enterprises of all sizes, along with pu public bodies and our communities with what this technology can achieve. A welcome priority as we move forward with our digital industries and developing for our economic future. It is, of course, absolutely about our economic future, as the digital economy is set by 2024 to be the fastest growing sector in Scotland. That means that we all must recognise that the impact of this digital revolution is no longer consigned to technological companies, but across all sectors, as increasing types of business are harnessing the benefits of technological to drive innovation and increase competitiveness. I want to repeat the last sentence again. Harnessing the benefits of technological to drive innovation. Yeah, as long as it's a good one. <laughs> Finlay Carson. Thank the member for taking the intervention. Given this uh, Scottish Government's less than brilliant reputation for delivering IT projects, for example, the, the agricultural payments or the police system, does, does the member have any confidence that this Government can deliver uh, uh, an innovative social security system? Uh, you know, the one thing about Richard the, UK, the what I don't call it a UK government, I call it an English government. And basically, your government, your government has wasted so much money over the years, caused so much misery to people over the years, and you have the cheek to stand up and say about this government, this government's doing far in excess better than your government has ever done, and it's puff. I want to repeat the last sentence again, harnessing the benefits of technological to drive innovation. Because as members will note from a previous contribution of the digital economy, I've been assisting a local uh, company who wish to see the Wi-Fi installed on lamp posts and to have the lamp posts powered by renewable energy. This type of innovative thinking and technology is essential as our industries develop for the future and contributing to the economy. I am delighted to note that various agencies within this SNP government are now supporting this company to pursue the, their ideas and make it a reality for communities in Scotland. And I hope particularly for those remote and remote rural areas that I so often hear about at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, for example. There can be no doubt that our digital and technological uh, technology sector is on the up and its contribution cannot be understated. To put it in perspective, in terms of the scale of digital and technological sectors, in 2015, presiding officer, the sector contributed billions to the Scottish economy and, over th and thousands of people were employed as tech professionals across all sectors. That's a significant and welcome investment. And as Mr. Neil said uh, earlier on, there are a thousand more jobs that could be created. But our people, and this news is only set to grow even higher, it's a testament to the support which this sector enjoys from business, the public and this government. Of course, with the growth in the sector, this is what we call a digital revolution. It continues to pick up pace 
and create an unprecedented demand for skills for employers across all sectors. Indeed, the government's economic action plan sets out a number of new and existing actions that will work together to build a strong, vibrant and diverse economy. And as I see my time has run out, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Lyle. We now move to closing speeches and we're back on, on time, on target. So no more than six minutes, please. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. As today's debate has highlighted, automation and the digitisation of the workplace is not some distant, faraway prospect. Technology is transforming almost every aspect of our lives, and it's doing so now. As Daniel Johnston stressed, the impact of this digital revolution is not simply consigned to technology companies. Every field, every sector is increasingly seeking to harness the benefits of technology. Businesses are making use of digital innovation to expand, improve efficiency and competitiveness and drive innovation. Our schools and other educational institutions are utilising technology to improve learning and access to education itself. As Alex Neil said, the NHS is using new technology more and more to improve services with predictive healthcare analytics facilitating a more preventative approach. It's impossible to overstate the impact digitisation has had and will have on our jobs, our economy, our services, on our lives. But with the opportunities of what has been described as a fourth industrial revolution also comes risks and threats if we do not ensure that the benefits of digitisation are realised for all. A few weeks ago, we discussed digital inclusion in this chamber and highlighted the importance of ensuring that groups across society are able to participate equally when it comes to access to digital. At present, rural communities, those on the lowest incomes, people with physical or mental health conditions, older people, women, all suffer because of digital exclusion. Exclusion that mirrors the wider social and economic inequalities that James Kelly spoke about. If we do not make digital inclusion a priority, digitisation will not only continue those inequalities, it will entrench them. Investing in our digital capabilities is not only essential to our long-term economic prosperity, if it is done properly, it's an opportunity to address injustice and inequalities, to create good, well-paid jobs in rural and deprived areas with targeted investment, to help close the gender gap by encouraging more women into STEM jobs, to give young people who do not want to go to university better career options, developing, for example, foundation and modern apprenticeship schemes. If we simply take a business as usual approach, those who are left behind will increasingly be unable to access essential services. They'll also not be able to access the job opportunities that changing technology can bring, but also they will be impacted negatively by that change. For example, Job losses caused by automation disproportionately affect those in lower paid jobs. As James Kelly highlighted, those affected or likely to be affected must have alternative opportunities by properly investing in adult learning and by ensuring that employers and those in the labour market are supported to embrace retraining and upskilling. Tackling that growing digital skills gap in Scotland will also mean truly embedding digital skills development in our schools right through to further and higher education. And of course, if we're serious about inclusive growth, we need to address the fundamental regional and social inequalities that exist in terms of digital infrastructure. How can we expect businesses in Orkney to take full advantage of the opportunities created by digitisation when superfast broadband coverage is as low as 65% in those areas? Lessons have to be learned from the rollout of the previous Scottish Government fibre broadband programme as we go forward. And instead of rural Scotland having to play catch up all the time, how about we give those communities a competitive advantage for once. Let me give the Minister one example of how we could achieve this in my own South Scotland region. Sitting on the desk of the UK and Scottish Government at the moment is a proposed Borderlands growth deal from Dumfries and Galloway and Scottish Borders Council, along with the three furthest North English local authorities. At present, less than a third of the people who live and do business in the borderlands area have access to super fast broadband connectivity and they can access average download speeds of just 8 to 10 megabits per second. A key component of the borderlands growth deal is to break down that digital divide through the digital borderlands plan. That plan seeks investment to, to complete the rollout of super fast broadband to the properties that don't yet have it to extend 4G coverage further 
into remote areas and crucially develop transformational hyperfast digital infrastructure in key settlements and employment sites, enabling speeds of one gigabit. In addition, the plan proposes using the borderlands as a pilot for emerging 5G technology and developing digital skills in an area which suffers a chronic shortage. Government funding for this type of outside-in approach, which prioritises rural areas for future investment, would give communities currently disadvantaged, such as the borderlands, a technological and economic advantage they have previously been denied. Supporting the borderlands growth deal would be a digital inclusion in action. It would help deliver the inclusive growth government talks about, but is so far out of the reach for far too many of our rural communities. Mm -hmm. President officer, delivering the benefits of the digital economy for all will require a comprehensive approach from schools to the workplace. It will take strategic leadership. The report automatic for the people included the recommendation that a Scottish Commission on the Fourth Industrial Revolution be established, bringing policymakers, industry, workers, academics, citizens and young people together to recommend that strategy and actions for government. It's a, a recommendation I would support because bringing key stakeholders together and more importantly developing a strategy that delivers for everyone and leaves no one behind is crucial. That's why Labour's amendment today unashamedly highlights issues such as digital democracy as well as a principle of fair work and the role of our trade unions in developing that strategy. Technology allows more efficient, effective methods of producing and delivering the existing and new products and services. It allows our society to become less dependent on time as work and more on output as work. That should release workers to enjoy and participate more in family and community life. President officer, the challenge for us all is to deliver not only growth in the digital economy, but also tackle digital exclusion, break down barriers to access and opportunity, and ensure that working people benefit from that growth. To coin a phrase, we need a fourth industrial revolution for the many, not the few. Thank you. I call Dean Lockhart for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We'll be voting for the Scottish Government's motion at decision time, but we've also lodged an amendment to highlight the significant opportunities available to Scotland's digital economy under the UK industrial strategy, which I will come back to later. The Minister opened the debate by rightly emphasising the importance of the digital economy and by providing an update on different initiatives in the digital economy, including digital growth funds and digital boost. We welcome these initiatives, but Scotland still faces a number of challenges that must be addressed if we are to achieve the objectives of increasing productivity and building Scotland's reputation as an innovative nation. Uh, in looking at how we can best address these challenges, let me frame this in the context of the Scottish Government's own economic policy, the policy of inclusive growth, internationalisation, investment and innovation. In terms of inclusive growth, much more needs to be done by the Scottish Government to ensure that the benefits and opportunities offered by digital are available to all. Ofcom has reported that internet use in Scotland is significantly lower than the rest of the UK. 23% of Scottish households do not have access to the internet and 21% of people do not have basic digital skills. Finlay Carson, Jamie Halcrow Johnson and Colin Smith highlighted that limited digital access is of particular concern in rural areas. And according to Audit Scotland, 370,000 households across Scotland still lack superfast internet speeds. But less than half of these are expected to be resolved by the Scottish Government's original 2021 deadline. Glacial progress indeed, as Mike Rumbles noted. Presiding officer, it's clear from this data that much more needs to be done by the Scottish Government to meet its original targets and to avoid hundreds of thousands of people across Scotland facing digital exclusion in the future. Turning to investment, the recent report, Automatic for the People, highlighted concerns about the increasing digital skills gap emerging in schools, colleges, apprenticeships and universities. This was mentioned by James Kelly, Patrick Harvey, Daniel Johnson and others during the debate. This reflects what we have seen after uh, 11 years of SNP government since 20. Uh, eight or 2008, we have seen the number of maths teachers declining by 15%, those teaching science declining by 12%, and the number of computer science teachers down by nearly a quarter. We've also seen a decline in college places and apprenticeships dedicated to science and digital subjects. If we really are to equip Scotland's workforce for a digital future, we need to address this underinvestment. Otherwise, the workforce of the future will not be prepared to capitalise on the digital opportunities. 
In terms of the internationalization agenda, we also face a critical shortage of digital support in the business environment. In giving evidence to the Economy Committee, Nora Senior, Chair of the Strategic Board, highlighted that only 9% of business in Scotland have embedded digital in their business operations. This compares to 43% among competitor countries. This digital gap poses a massive challenge if we are to increase productivity and a massive challenge for those companies looking to increase global trade and exports. The global export market and international trade is increasingly dominated by online commerce and digital platforms. I saw this myself firsthand earlier this year during a trade mission to Hong Kong and China. I met with a number of trading companies whose business models for import and export are now predominantly online, meaning that they largely trade with other businesses who will only use e-commerce and digital platforms. This means Scottish, I will in a second, Scottish businesses will lose out on massive trading opportunities available in the global market if we don't address this digital gap. I'll give way. Willie Coffey. Taking the intervention though, but could you say something about the European digital single market, please, and whether you think we should be in that or out of that? <laughs> Dean Lockhart. Well, that's obviously going to be subject to the negotiation, but the, the kind of precursor to that is having business in Scotland digital ready, and that's my point. There is no specialist public agency in Scotland dedicated to the establishment of e-commerce and digital platforms for business and international trade. To address this digital, digital gap, we are calling for the establishment of a dedicated institute of e-commerce for Scotland to help Scottish business move online. I, I need to make some progress, sorry. A dedicated, I might in a second, a dedicated institute of e-commerce, a specialist support agency that will help to move businesses large and small online to take advantage of global opportunities in e-commerce. This policy has gained significant support in the business community and I look forward to hearing the Minister's response to this policy initiative. Finally, in the crucial area of innovation, the SCDI has called for Scotland to actively participate in the UK industrial strategy. This is reflected in our amendment to the motion today, calling for the Scottish Government to work closer with the UK Government to help deliver the real benefits uh, of the industrial strategy to Scotland. In recent years, Innovate UK has invested £2.5 billion in innovative businesses across the UK. And the British Business Bank has helped to unlock £10 billion of new finance for business across the country. By actively participating in the UK industrial strategy, Scottish business can tap into innovative digital markets across the UK and also tap into UK-wide research and development and financing opportunities. Presiding officer, in this area, as with many other areas, Scotland's business will be significantly better off if we fully capitalise on the benefits of being part of the fifth largest economy in the world. I support the amendment in Finlay Carson's name. I call Kate Forbes to wind up the debate. You have eight minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank the members today um, for their contributions to this interesting and valuable debate. And I think it's fair to say that the importance of the digital economy to Scotland and its people is paramount, and that view is shared by the majority of people in the Chamber. There were some highlights in the speeches, the common theme running through those highlights were people that actually engaged with the motion before us. Um, and I take on board the comments that were made by opposition members and stress once again that I believe that the clear digital strategy that we have set out is the correct one. However, we are open to ideas and particularly as the First Minister for the digital economy explicitly, I am open to uh, the ideas of opposition members when it comes to dealing with the when it comes to dealing with the thorny issues that are before us. And I would actually like to talk about those thorny issues um, and will um, continue here. The first issue that was raised by James Kelly and um, reiterated by Colin Smith was about the importance of digital inclusion and digital participation. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a critically important point to recognise that the debates in this chamber do often feel like a, an echo chamber when it comes to recognising the challenges that are faced, particularly by those that are perhaps disadvantaged by poverty um, or by other aspects when it comes to engaging with digital. And we know that digital has the potential to be inclusive. We have to be intentional about doing that. 
we have invested £1.5 million in the Digital Participation Charter Fund, which has supported 169 local projects across Scotland to enable over 20,000 people to gain or improve their essential digital skills. And that dig Digital Participation Charter has secu secured commitment from nearly 600 public, private and third sector organisations to build on those digital skills. And I'm also working with social housing providers to try and ensure that there is affordable internet solutions for older people, for people with disabilities and for hard to reach single people. Moving on to businesses. Oh, well, I, Mike Rumbles wants to help. <laughs> Mike Rumbles. I, I thank the Minister for taking my intervention. I actually think for the people that aren't connected, in a practical point, the people that aren't, aren't connected now for the last 5%, it would be immensely helpful to them if the Minister could lay out a date when she could actually tell them when they might be connected. Kate Forbes. And I'm sure I will pass on that question to the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, yeah. who is responsible for the rollout. The debate before us to this today is about the digital economy. And whilst connectivity is a critical aspect to that, there are some really complex issues that I think it would serve us all well to engage with. Gordon Lindhurst made a good point that uh, infrastructure without skills would not get us the progress that we need. And I wanted to quote some of the, the stats that he started quoting from the, the Debs survey, that 34% of businesses are doing something now to address the skills issue, which is up from 26% in 2014, and that 48% of businesses stated that they were well equipped with the skills, but they recognised there were some gaps. And we recognise that the role here, in terms of the pace of change that Daniel Johnson outlined, to support businesses to meet that skills gap. Patrick Harvey eh, and others talked about the need for rights um, and to ensure that we have the ethics in place and that we develop on an ongoing basis with other governments across the world the legal framework that we need as technology continues to emerge. I quoted at the beginning, and I want to return to it, the Five Rights campaign that we are supporting in conjunction with Young Scott to ensure that young people in particular know the rights they have in relation to online, the right to remove, the right to know who, what, why, and for what purposes they are sharing their data, the right to safety and support, the right to informed and conscious use of online, and the right to digital literacy. Yes. Oh, Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful. Uh, in, in relation to one of those, the, 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 the right to, give, uh, to, to know how your data is being used, does the Minister acknowledge that the, 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 the GDPR attempt to address that, while well-meaning, has in fact resulted in the vast majority of us simply clicking yes, 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 accept, 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 to a blizzard of these requests? It's not meaningful consent to anything that's being provided that way. Kate Ford would agree with the member that we want all citizens to feel confident that their personal data is being shared responsibly to create better and more responsive services. But in order to do that, they need to understand what their data is being used for and to feel empowered to actually engage um, and to agree or disagree. I want to finish with um, Daniel Johnson's speech which I thought, if I might say so, was one of the most perceptive in terms of the um, challenges that we face, but also <coughs> the opportunities. Daniel Johnson talked about the, the perception that digital has the potential, automation has the potential to destroy jobs. And I think we need to be intentional that digital actually includes more of the population. I quoted at the beginning that we need about 12,800 new entrants to the tech sector just to stand still. And so there is an opportunity there for our current workforce to train them, to reskill them, to upskill them, and also to ensure that we've got the skills that will never be replaced by machinery, particularly the emotional skills, the soft skills that will continue to be needed. Daniel Johnson talked about an ecosystem with the universities, and I think that's particularly obvious somewhere like uh, Edinburgh, where um, whether it's been driven by the um, city deal or um, local authorities and government working in partnership to ensure that universities know what skills are needed and actually put in place the training that is needed for that. But lastly, and this is what I want to close on, he talked about 
the, the investment that's needed in SMEs, and Alex Neil touched on that as well in terms of uh, training. And the Scottish Government has funded Code Clan with just over £3 million of investment to date, which is the first industry-led digital skills academy that offers students an intensive four-month training programme with direct access to employers. So that businesses, wherever they are, whether they're in the Highlands or in the, one of our cities, I've got 60 seconds, oh no, less than 60 seconds left, um, have the um, skills that they need that industry um, outlines the skills that they need and we ensure that they have them in an intensive way. But there are other ways that we're supporting businesses, particularly around cyber resilience. I, and my colleague Derek Mackay launched the Cyber Resilience Economic Opportunity Action Plan. And that provides voucher schemes to SMEs to ensure that they have the cyber resilience that they need. There's also the, the digital boost and also the digital voucher scheme to target our investment in SMEs to ensure that they have the skills that they need and that we in Scotland lead on the digital revolution and that countries around the world look to Scotland to see what is happening in terms of the partnership between public, private and third sector to take advantage of the new opportunities that come with the digital economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes our debate on developing Scotland's digital industries for our economic future. We're going to move on to the next item of business, and that's consideration of business motion 14834 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision of tomorrow's business. Does any member wish to speak against this motion? No. Uh, could I call on Graham Day, Mr Day, sorry, could I call on Graham Day to, just to move the motion, Mr Day? Thank you. Uh, the question is that motion 14834 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, as members may recall, we have a procedure now to allow some time to be set aside at the end of the day for committees to raise uh, business of importance to them, such as committee reports or um, urgent inquiries. And in that context, I would like to call Bill Kidd, convener of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, to make an announcement on the report on confidentiality of reports from the Commissioner for Ethical Standards for Public Life in Scotland. And I call Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, and on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, I would like to draw the Parliament's attention to a report published last week on the Committee's handling of reports about MSP's conduct from the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. The Committee considers these reports in private before reporting to the Parliament, stating whether it agrees with the Commissioner and what sanctions, if any, it recommends the Parliament should impose. If details about either a complaint or the contents of the subsequent Commissioner's report appear in the public domain before the Committee has considered and reported on the matter, the Committee may have to carry out its responsibilities against a backdrop of external comment, speculation and judgment. Publicity and media coverage resulting from breaches of confidentiality may act as a disincentive to making a formal complaint, particularly if it is of a sensitive nature. I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the committee to remind all members of the requirements under the Code of Conduct that they must not disclose, communicate or discuss any complaint or intention to make a complaint to or with members of the press or other media prior to the lodging of the complaint or during the committee's consideration of the complaint. Members are also reminded of their obligations under section seven of the code to keep certain committee material confidential. The committee intends to take action against future breaches of these code of conduct provisions and will not view ignorance of the rules as a mitigating factor in deciding what sanction to recommend against a member. And thank you on behalf of the committee. Thank you very much. And that concludes our business. We turn now to decision time. And the first question today is that Amendment 14807.1 in the name of Finlay Carson, which seeks to amend Motion 14807 in the name of Kate Forbes on developing Scotland's digital industries for our economic future be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 14807.2 in the name of James Kelly, 
which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Kate Forbes be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 14807 in the name of Kate Forbes as amended on developing Scotland's digital industries for our economic future be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. We will now move to members' business in the name of Lewis MacDonald on Offshore Wind Week 2018. Uh, we'll just take a few moments, if we can, though, for the members and ministers to change seats. <laughs>